Hello, my beautiful audience. Welcome to episode four of the Past the Time podcast. Because you know there's no better way to pass the time than by reading creepypastas. We're joined again by my special guest, Jay Z Nicholas. But this is a special occasion. He's requested this that I read request, yeah. this specific creepypasta. It's called Abandoned by Disney. And uh, who are we giving this credit to, Jay-Z? To uh, Slime Beast. To Slime Beast. Alias. That's his alias. Yep. He has a little website, so just Google Here's Slime Beast. Other, okay. Yeah, there's tons of other yeah. stuff on his website. So if you want to read more of this stuff, this is actually part of a series. So uh, we'll see how the sequels compare later on. Later on. <laughs> But yeah, got anything you want to say before we get this on the you know, get the show on the road, Jay Z? Um, no, I found this on Reddit on the subreddit. Pre post, there's a bunch of other stuff on there. So if you want to check out that's uh, that place too, go ahead. Give nice credit to Reddit. Yep. And uh, yeah, before we start, I'll give another little shout out to Jay Z from the Couch Watch podcast. He uh, talks all about entertainment, video yep. games, TV, all that fun stuff. I know I download. So should you. Yeah. <laughs> but without further ado, here's Abandoned by Disney by Slime Beast. Whoa. Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real life ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists to relax in luxury. This is a fact, look it up. Disney blew through $30 million on the place. Yes, $30 million. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate, and there was even blame cast on the workers, saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy, though both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. Then why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character Mowgli, then you might better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you'd know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli's an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened slash pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was the concept art, where a group of stuffed shirts from Disney Co. actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear, well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle and loincloth not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also in a somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas, Disney sunk those millions in and split on a dime. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounded communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irate tourists. 
Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give this place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about it in this crazy shit they found there. Stuff just, just left behind. Things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had just lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there just felt as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's Palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that the blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace. Take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there, but honestly it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the Palace Resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of this place, this place that had been scrubbed clean. Even odder, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about this place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about this place, though that was to be expected since they all swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lauding their embarrassment, you know? Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old as hell map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to the people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent? I didn't really intend to hang on to it, it just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I'd only remembered it months into my research, and even then, it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years, or older residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I find Mowgli's palace? The drive took me through an inordinary long corridor of overgrowth. Tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort, tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gates was a sheet of metal, some random scrap, with hand-painted letters scald in black. Abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not to drive. So grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed the layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the palace were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood unattended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking, bug-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures was broken, rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped up by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly toothy grin as bird shit covered the whole swaths of his fur and vines ensnared his platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint had peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping maw where they had been, someone had once again painted, abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about the awesome stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, and a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums? But no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, 
that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid the empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-tat-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan and headed to the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space, no expenses spared. Every glass surface is broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented, the entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist, then carefully letting it go, but within seconds, it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like the Treasure Island Resort, someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and their implements. There was about a half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and sinks and the bidets in the ladies' room, yes, I went there, all dripped, leaked, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut off the water long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in that resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. The few that I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on my mind, this is what it sounded like. I didn't believe it, followed by a short, unknown reply. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your father told you, followed by another unknown reply, possibly just weeping. I know I know that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been someone running in the room, or worse, some vagrants who had holed up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed before. Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe eight feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell onto the object perfectly for the photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head looked directly into my eyes, turned and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass and into the trees. All eight feet of it, its head long, disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the sunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there under the floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I'd read about the sharks in Treasure Isle, and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been, back towards the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slaps to my own face to get myself right in the head again after that. I looked for a place to sit down as my legs were feeling a bit like jelly at this point. Of course there was no place to sit down, unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet, or haul myself onto a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace's lobby and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for a startling accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the abandoned by Disney motto I'd become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh of doors with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign, read, Mascots only. Thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit, for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would probably have, definitely have something interesting. Two. The padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wanton at least steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. 
Well, actually that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me, and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall, something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascot's only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens, there were clocks, even a punch clock on the wall complete with filled out time cards. Chairs were scattered around and there was even a small break room with an old static filled television and long rotted out food and drinks on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalyptic movies where everything is left in the state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascot's only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, papers scattered and almost melted to the floor, and a large carpet of mold was slowly taking over the real rotting crimson floor. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything wood disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to the moist threads if I even tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dark, suffocating depths of this place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words Character Prep 1 stenciled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is until I gave up and started walking away. That was when there was a slight popping sound and the door creaked open, slowly. Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to just keep getting brighter until all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers hanging from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloth and native clothing on hangers towards the back. What I found odd, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the center of the floor like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shredding, creating bare patches. What was even odder, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of his actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white, and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls, upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen, putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, just one of the bag-raggled character heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, molding head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet, and there between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know? I had to, for any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I'd need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind, right from the start, that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, that photo-negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet. The Mickey Mouse costume, or whatever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, over and over and over. With shaking hands, a violently thrashing heart, and legs that had once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the creature now sizing me up. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixels spread, marring the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went blank and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey costume. Hey, 
It said, in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice, Want to see my head come off? It started to pull out its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements, similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free from a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood. So much thick, chunky, yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh. I only cared about getting away. Above the doorway out of this room, I saw a final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for my sanity if not my very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in, and they didn't want anything like that getting out. Well, that was a nice build-up for a very creepy ending. What did you think about yeah. that, Jay-Z? That was, that was really good. Really creepy. I, like, yeah, I, like, I really like the build-up, like you said. Um, yeah. I definitely agree. That was a pretty good creepy pasta. Yeah, that was very uh, very uh, realistic too. I'd like to thank you for recommending me that yeah. one because I've <laughs> I've read like articles online kind of like of people going to these ghost towns or ghost yeah. amusement parks and I always thought it was just like the coolest thing ever. I don't know why I have such an interest in that. Maybe because like as a kid you love yeah. that type of stuff. Like of course, yeah. It's the best time you look forward to it all year. Oh, let's go to the fair. It's going to be so <laughs> much fun. And then like a story like that turns it on its head it's, and you're yeah. just like oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. What a twist to the end. Yes. I was I was not expecting uh just the suit to come alive and rip off its own head. Yeah. I was uh probably at the back of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, the last oh. thing I'd think of, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm like, oh, this whole story, oh, this is predictable ending. Getting his head ripped off. What would you rate that one, Jay Z? I'd rate that uh probably same as last last episode's eight point five. Eight point five? Like that, yeah. I'll probably give that one uh Probably an 8.5 as well. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. They, uh, I liked the story at the beginning. It wasn't, like, too boring of backstory. It was pretty interesting. Just yeah, like it, those are, like, real facts, too. Yeah, yeah, like, when they take the realism of it yeah. and make it into a story, th- those are the ones yeah, that I like the really most. Good, yeah. So that was definitely awesome. I didn't like That's it great. as much as uh, Bedtime, but I do like it a lot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was, this is a really good, uh, really good story. I'm glad I actually <laughs> saw this. So. Yes, I'd like to thank you again for yeah, recommending no me this one. And I very much enjoyed reading it. Yeah, shout out to a Slime Beast again. Yes, give out uh, some mad props to Slime Beast. Go check out his website. Just Google Slime Beast. That's what I did. Yeah. And uh, you'll find him. Find some more creepy stories of his. If you'd like to follow Jay Z, his podcast is the Couch Watch Podcast. Yes, sir. Available on iTunes. Yep. Where can they follow you, Jay Z? You got Twitter? Uh, yeah, I got Twitter cou- at Couchwatch PC, and uh, I got a blog starting uh, Couchwatch, I believe Couchwatch.blogspot.ca. <laughs> Couchwatch.blogspot.ca. Yeah. Yes, and you can always follow us, the beautiful Pasta Time, on Instagram at Pasta Time. Actually, I think it might be at Pasta Time Podcast. I also got the Facebook going, Past the Time podcast. You'll find us. Yeah. And uh, I'm getting the Twitter going with it, too. Nice. So uh, it should be up pretty soon. It'll be at Past the Time podcast because <laughs> yeah. nobody has Past the Time podcast but me. I run that. You run this. I'll run this town. Yeah, hopefully you could uh, get shown up on iTunes now. Yes, it uh, hasn't been showing up on iTunes, but it will be very soon, hopefully. Yep. So I would like to thank my amazing audience for sticking with us with this creepy pasta. Because you know what? There's no better way to pass the time yeah. than by reading creepy pastas. Or you can just listen to my podcast, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I do the reading, so you don't have to, right? There Perfect. You go. Perfect. It's a win win situation. But I will see you next time on Pasta Time Podcast. Ooh.